In this class, we are often looking at these kind of macro events. We're looking at Japan, China, and Korea from a kind of bird's eye view. And typically, then we are not able to talk a lot about individuals. And I may mention individual, and we'll just have one slide on them, and then kind of go on from there and talk about how that individual fits into the larger history. And that's kind of necessary because of the nature of this class. We're trying to look at three different countries and how they relate to each other. But it can also make us miss some important details. It can also, in particular, the problem with it is it can make it so we don't quite understand the perspective of the people who lived in these times. And a big part of history is trying to understand why people behaved the way they did. And through that, we can better understand why things have happened, right? Uh, one important aspect of history is we're studying cause. And history is essentially the uh, study of how things have changed over time and why they have changed. And we can't understand that without understanding how individuals experienced history. So we're going to look at one individual in this part in particular, a man named Thomas Anchun Gun. And one reason I like to focus on him in particular is, first of all, I'm a specialist in this guy. I've, I, my dissertation, a large part of it, was about him. Uh, to complete a PhD, you have to be able to complete a dissertation, which is basically a book-length paper. And also, I've given a lot of presentations on him, uh, published some articles on him, and he's very important in Korean history and is very popular among Koreans. If you were to go up to uh, any Korean and were to say, do you know who An Chung Gun is? They will say, yes, I know who An Chung Gun was. So I think he's a good person to kind of do this project with, to help us better understand what things are uh, happening from the perspective of one of the people living in this time, right? So we're looking, uh, he gives us this kind of window into the Korean perspective of this time and why Koreans might act in particular ways. And to give you a sense of his importance in Korea today, uh, a few years ago, you can see that building on the right. That is a memorial hall dedicated to this figure, to An Chung Gun. And uh, it's a really a beautiful building, and they really did a fantastic job. And it's in this really prominent place in Seoul, the capital of Korea. So, you know, he's considered so important in Korea today that they're willing to spend several million dollars to build this beautiful uh, memorial hall in his honor. And inside the memorial hall is a museum. And there I am giving a guided tour to some students who have come to participate in a workshop that we were putting on about him. Right. So again, that shows the importance of this person, that, the, uh, that they're willing to fund these students. This was a free workshop for these students. In fact, the students were fed and housed and, uh, for a couple days so they could participate in this. So this is, uh, like I say, this is a, an important person in Korean history who's widely respected in Korea today. So he also gives us a sense of how Koreans today understand their history. Right. So this is important for us to really understand East Asia of how history is remembered and how it impacts things today. And here is the group photo that we took there. You can see uh, me up in the front and to my right is the uh, is a former prime minister of Korea. Uh, Korea is kind of complex because they have both a prime minister and a president. The president is usually wields political power while the prime minister is more of an honorary position. But it's interesting that the head of the An Chung uh, Society that is connected to this memorial hall is a former prime minister of Korea. And that gives you the idea of its importance. And to the right of him, from our perspective, is uh, Director Lee, who for several years was in charge of the An Chung Memorial Hall. Um, and she is the one who organized this uh, workshop. And you can see all these different people from around the world who have come to participate. Now, they, they didn't usually travel from around the world, they, uh, but some uh, they were already studying in, in uh, Korea, but there's people from Europe, there's people from Japan, there's, of course, some people from Korea. And we had a very interesting discussion and conversation together about An Chung Gun. On the far right in the front row, uh, there is my uh, co-translator. She and I have done a lot of work together, very good uh, scholar, that, and we work and have done a lot together about this guy. But you can see his statue in the very back, that is An Chung Gun, and behind him is an early form of the flag that is currently the, uh, the flag of the Republic of Korea, and it contains, you'll see some uh, Chinese characters, 
and that those characters read uh, Korean independence, or literally Great Korea's independence. So he's remembered by Koreans as someone who struggled for independence. And one thing that's particularly striking about him is that that flag, um, the, the writing on the flag, this isn't the actual flag, this is a reproduction, but the writing on the original flag was in his own blood, right? So he actually cut off part of his, uh, one of his fingers, and then with blood wrote Korea's independence on that flag. And in East Asia, there's this understanding uh, that self-inflicted violence shows your sincerity, right? So he's saying, this is how much I care about Korea's independence, that I'm willing to sacrifice my finger and write in my own blood my love of Korean independence. Right? So this, is, uh, this man is a, an important nationalist and independence fighter in Korea's history. Those workshops were aimed principally at graduate students, but the Anchungu Memorial Hall and the related uh, society, they will also hold conferences at which researchers, scholars will do original research and present that to other scholars and to the wider public. So it was interesting, this was a conference open to the public. When I was invited to it, I agreed to go. And I thought that I would just be talking to a few scholars and they brought us in this big auditorium and we were talking like 60 or 70 people from the wider uh, community, which is, is always interesting uh, because some, they're uh, going to bring their own kind of different questions. And sometimes they were, were uh, very argumentative, uh, which was kind of interesting, but also uh, enjoyable to hear their perspective on things. And you can see there I am and on my left is a, my colleague who helps uh, with my translation. We work together on the Anchungun materials. And to her left, you can see a, a woman who was a ethnic Korean from Russia and did research on Russian materials. She actually doesn't know how to speak Korean, but does speak Russian and English. It was quite nice. And if you look to the, the right of me, you can see a Japanese former diplomat to, uh, to several different countries, but he was a Japanese diplomat to, to multiple countries. And then you can also see further right, Director Lee, a Japanese specialist in the history uh, and philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And so there's a lot of interesting people there talking about, about An Chingun from a lot of different perspectives, right? So this is interesting. This is not simply someone who Koreans are interested in, but someone who uh, there's this kind of international interest in as well. And one thing I want to stress, they paid for all of us to come and paid our food and our lodging and all that. So they're, like I said, the Korean government and this Anchungun Association, they're willing to put money behind the study of this national hero. Of course, it's no surprise that the Anchungun Memorial Association would want to sponsor events related to Anchungun. But one thing uh, I want to note in terms of more of the uh, influence of Anchungun throughout Korean society and how it can even become uh, even more international from what we have previously seen in two th the 2018, in the fall, the Consulate General of the Republic of Korea of Los Angeles decided to host a workshop slash conference on the subject of building peace in East Asia. And they invited me to present uh, on Anchungun. And they also invited some other people to present on Anchungun as well. So I thought it was interesting that you would have these Korean diplomats and the face, in a sense, they wanted to associate with Korea was that of An Chungun. So now then, having spoken a little bit about how An Chungun is important today to Koreans, we now need to look, talk a little bit about his life. So first of all, An Chungun came from a family of some wealth. They were what we would call, um, they weren't quite young bon. They were like a step below young bon. They were called young bon which meant that they were kind of the gentry who lived out in the provinces, right? They were the gentry who lived out in the provinces and they controlled a good amount of land in their local area that they lived in. So that gave them some wealth and this is an agricultural country, Korea at this time, so wealth is measured in land. And they invested that wealth into maintaining their status. Remember Yangban, and they're similar to Yangban, these kind of country gentry, they show that they are a members of the elite by engaging in ritual practices. So they perform the various Confucian rituals publicly, and it's known that they, they, they perform that, and that helps to cement their status as the Confucian elite that we spoke about in a previous section. 
And in addition, they also gave to charity. They would support people who were poor, who needed medicine, who were in that kind of situation, people in need. And that, of course, raised their status in the local society as well. So An Chungun came from a family of wealth and status, but not on a national level, just on a local level, right? They're not one of the most powerful families in the country. They are a rural family that is elite in the countryside and in their local area. Now, being landholders and investing that, that uh, wealth from that land into charity and to performing rituals, that gave you high status, but it was also necessary to receive an education. And of course, this meant a Confucian style education. So An Chungun and his ancestors for several generations back were educated in Confucianism, right? They, they got that traditional education. They learned how to read and write classical Chinese. They learned how to read the Confucian books and they gained that knowledge and wisdom that those books contain. And they also gained those values, ideas of loyalty and benevolence and so forth. They also would hold government office. Now, again, they're in the countryside. They're not going to hold central government office, but they will gain local positions at first with military offices. And some of An Chungun's ancestors are going to receive military degrees. There was also, uh, we mentioned before that the civil service exams to become officials, there was also military degrees. They weren't as prestigious as the civil degrees. Remember, in China and Korea, the civil was considered above the military. It was a little bit different from Japan. But they did have these degrees, and An Chungun's ancestors started off getting some of these military degrees and holding local military posts. Later, they would transition and start trying to, and start holding local civil positions. For example, An Chungun's grandfather, instead of being a military official, would pass some of the civil service exams and become a local magistrate. Right? He would actually become a local magistrate. And An Chungun's own father, he would pass also the first civil service exam, though he himself would not hold office. So An Chungun, like I said, he comes from a family that would kind of like to be Yangban. They're not quite recognized as such on a national level, but they are recognized in their local community as people of education, as people of status, and as people of wealth. And they, they have these things, and, and they're going to be very important in terms of them taking a role in national affairs later on. An Chungun's family was basically upwardly mobile, they were people who were rising up in society, right? I, we, I mentioned that they had this land, they conducted these rituals, they, uh, they gained Confucian educations, and they were climbing up in terms of the bureaucracy, right? In terms of government positions, right? They're successfully making this transition from being military officials to being local civil officials. However, there is a problem. There's a limit to how high they can cl climb. They are from a place called Huanghe Province, which is in the more northwestern part of Korea. And the problem during this time period is government positions of power generally go to a small group of Yangban families who live in or around Seoul, right? So remember, we talked about this earlier, the Korean civil service exams are generally meant to ensure the continued power of the Yangban. And there was a lot of competition for government positions. So these positions ended up becoming monopolized by a very small group of Yangban who lived around Seoul. And they made sure that only their families got those positions. So people from places like Huanghe province are left out of the more powerful central government positions. Right? So an Chungun is in this kind of interesting, and his family are in this kind of interesting place in that they're on the rise, but they're kind of hitting a ceiling, right? The best they can do is maybe holding some local positions, right? The best they can do is holding some local positions. If we put all this together then and understand An background, I would call him a marginal intellectual. 
he is educated, he understands Confucianism, and he can read and write classical Chinese, which will give him a window to the outside world eventually. And so he is able to embrace reform, right? He's able to embrace reform because he's going to have the education and the resources necessary to do that, right? So he is educated, so he understands what's going on. And he has the resources because his family has wealth, so he's going to be able to act on that. Moreover, and this is also key, by marginal, I mean he's someone who's outside the mainstream of power. right? He's someone who's outside the mainstream of power. So he's willing to change the system. Right? He's willing to change the system because he's not winning in the system. Basically, his family has hit the ceiling. They're not going to be able to rise up any higher in Korean society as it is because the, the uh, pathway to power is through holding central government office and that pathway is closed off to him because he's not from the right area. He's from the north. So he's someone who's educated, who is intelligent, and who has resources. So he's able to reform. He has that capacity and he's willing to follow through with reform because it promises to help his country and help him. And that's why he is, I think, very similar to those lower samurai who helped bring about the Meiji Restoration. Right? He's part of that class who is able to engage in reform and willing to engage in reform. Now, I want to tell you about something that happened to him when he was quite young. When he was only about 16 years old, that's when the Tonghak Rebellion broke out. Remember we talked about the Tonghak Rebellion? How it was this uh, kind of anti-foreign rebellion uh, based around this religious group, the Tonghak, who were tired of being persecuted and who were upset about the changes being brought in Korea. Right? And remember, I, I, I mentioned that before, this group is often looked at today as kind of early nationalists in Korea. And one thing that's interesting is that An Chung-gun wrote a autobiography in which he discussed what happened in his life and explained why he acted the way he did. And I think it's fascinating for us to better understand how Koreans themselves understood the situation they were in by looking at his autobiography. So he wrote in his autobiography, in 1894, the so-called Tonghak Rebellion broke out all over the country. They ran rampant and used the pretext of expelling the foreigners from Korea as an excuse to kill officials and steal from the people. Oh dear, he does not like the Tonghak. And that's something that we need to really understand if we want to understand Korean history, is while there's this effort when people look back at Korean history, especially Koreans, to try and create this unified history, there was a lot of division among Koreans about what they should do and how society should be organized. Now, An Chigun does know, because this he's writing this in 1909, uh, that there's a problem. He writes, at this time, things were becoming more dangerous for Korea. It would be over our country that the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars would be fought. So he does understand that. Later, and remember, we mentioned this uh, earlier, that Sino and Russo-Japanese wars are being fought for that reason. Koreans do understand that, though he understands it a little bit later. His focus during this time period is not the Sino-Japanese War, it is the Tonghak. He continues on to write, Since the Korean army was not able to suppress them, the Tonghak, China mobilized troops and sent them to Korea, as did Japan. The soldiers of these two countries clashed, and eventually a great war broke out between them. So he does understand that the Sino-Japanese War happened, but his focus is not so much on that, but on the Tonghak Rebellion itself. And to continue in his autobiography, he writes... At that time, my father knew that it would be difficult to resist the deprivations of the Tonghawk, and he sent out notices to like-minded people calling on them to join him. He mobilized hunters and even organized the women and children into units. Uh, the hunters, by the way, were tiger hunters. They were tough guys. They went out in the mountains and, and, and hunted tigers. And they hunted these with matchlock rifles, which aren't really good rifles. Uh, there was a group of about 70 crack troops who were stationed in defensive positions throughout the mountains so that they could fight against the Tonghawk. The Tonghak army, led by Won Yong-gil, consisted of some 20,000 men. It was actually much smaller, but that, this is just An Chung-gun's impression. 
When they advanced, their flags and weapons glittered in the sunlight, and the sound of their bugles, drums, and war cries shook heaven and earth. Our righteous army, and this is a term that was also used to describe those Koreans who fought against the Japanese, but he's using it to describe Koreans fighting against other Koreans, did not have more than 70. In terms of our comparative strength, we were like an egg thrown against a stone. The people were afraid and did not know what to do. So it's important to stress that this rebellion was not simply against foreigners. It involved Koreans fighting each other, right? These peasant Koreans who are launching the Tonghak Rebellion do not like elites like An Chungun and his family, right? Because they're the local elites who often control all the land. These peasants don't like them. So we have a kind of class conflict here uh, between these different Koreans. And to continue, uh, An Chungun writes, it was the winter of the 12th month. Suddenly the east wind blew and there was a great downpour. It was difficult to see even a short distance. The clothes and armors of the enemy soldier were fully drenched and clung to their bodies, chilling them to the bone. There was nothing else for them to do but to retreat to a village about 10 li distant and make camp there. That night my father held counsel with his officers and said, if we sit and wait for them to encircle us and attack, we will certainly be defeated. We must launch a surprise attack tonight. Then he ordered the soldiers to eat their breakfast at Cockcrow, and after that, for 40 picked men to begin their march against the enemy, while the remaining soldiers would defend our base in Chonge. Six other like-minded comrades and I volunteered to go in advance as scouts. Remember, Anchegun's only 16 at this time. We went out ahead to locate the enemy and drew close enough to see their commander. We hid ourselves in a grove of trees and scout out the movements and positions of their forces. Their flags fluttered in the wind. So large were their fires that they rose up to heaven, and it was as bright as day in their camp. The men and horses were very noisy, and there was absolutely no discipline at all. I turned to my comrades and said, If we attack the enemy now, we will certainly win a great battle. They asked, How can our tiny force possibly stand against this great army of tens of thousands? Like I said, he's exaggerating the, the size, but it still was uh, several thousand men. I replied, no, we can do it. The art of war says, if you know yourself and your enemy, even if you fight 100 battles, you'll win 100 victories. I have seen the state of the enemy, and they are nothing but a disordered rabble. If we seven unite our hearts and strength, then even if we face an army of a million, where it is as disciplined as this one, we would have nothing to fear. It is not yet daylight. If we attack them now and take them by surprise, nothing can stop us. Do not doubt my strategy. Just follow it. They all agreed with me, and we formulated our plan. Then, with a great shout, the seven of us began to fire into the enemy encampment where their commander was. The sound of our guns shook heaven and earth like thunder. Our bullets rained down like hail. The enemy was caught completely off guard and was helpless. They were not wearing their armor, nor did they have their weapons. They trampled each other as they fled over the mountains and through the valleys. We pressed our advantage and gave chase. Then, after a short time, the sun began to rise, and it became bright enough for the enemy to realize how isolated and weak we were. They enveloped us, that is, they surrounded us, and attacked from all directions. We were in great danger and dashed this way and that, looking for a way to escape, but failed to find one. Suddenly there was a roar of gunfire from behind. A unit of soldiers! They clashed with the enemy and drove them back in defeat, freeing us from our encirclement. They were reserves from our headquarters that had come to rescue us. We joined forces, pressed our attack, and scattered the enemy in a complete rout. Among the spoils of war were ten loads of weapons and ammunition, horses without number, and about a thousand sacks of rice. There were scores of dead and wounded among the enemy, but among the soldiers of our righteous army, not one was even injured. This was thanks to the grace of heaven. We shouted Monse three times. Uh, Monse is the Korean equivalent of Banzai. They're made up of two Chinese characters that mean 10,000 years. It, it's similar to like Spanish Viva. Uh, so Japanese shout, manse, or shout bonsai, Korean shout manse. We then returned triumphantly to our village and immediately reported our victory to the provincial governor. At that time, a Japanese officer named Suzuki happened to pass us leading his soldiers. He also would have been fighting the Tonghawk. He sent a letter to congratulate us on our victory. After that, we did not hear of any more battles being fought. Eventually, the Tonghawk movement died away and peace returned to our country. So what was the significance of all this? Well, first of all, I just wanted you to, to see this. Uh, this is the translation that I've been working on with my colleague, Jun Han, who I mentioned earlier. And I wanted you to see things from the perspective of the, this uh, very interesting Korean man, An Chung-gun, 
And I think that showed that perspective. And, and I just, I like the guy. I think he's a, a fascinating person. Uh, he's one of those historical figures I'd love to sit down and talk with because he just seems fascinating. And he gave us this very, very vivid description of this battle, of this conflict. But it also depicts something about this guy's character. Uh, he's brave to the point of being reckless, right? Uh, even if he exaggerates the number of people in the opposing army, it's basically him and six other guys, and they just go ahead and attack, right? So just imagine this. You know, you're the 16-year-old with a gun, and you're out with your buddies. You're like, yeah, let's just go attack this opposing army. Let's just do that. That seems like a good idea. It darn near gets him and his buddies killed, but then they're rescued by their comrades, and together, through their discipline and th the fact that they're united together, they're over able to overcome this Tonghawk army. And this gives this sense to An Chingun, I think, that violence works. That violence can be an appropriate and legitimate solution to your problems. And the reason why he thinks he sees violence as necessary is because his family's position and the local community is threatened by these Tonghawk rebels. And this indicates how Korea, uh, we had talked about Korea had divisions, social and class dis distinctions and divisions. Well, they've gotten so bad that some Koreans are rising up to try and change the system. So the Tonghawk rebellion, even though it was, we often think of as an anti-foreign rebellion, was also in a sense being undertaken to improve the position of the peasants. And elites like An Chungun and his family don't like that uh, because the peasants basically want to take their land. An Chungun and his family would like to keep it. And you can see there's even further divisions because, of course, some peasants, the local villagers, felt close to An Chungun and his family because, after all, they had provided them with charity uh, and so forth, and they had a close working relationship. So we have to emphasize this is kind of like a Korean civil war because you have some Koreans who don't like the, the rebels and who are going to fight against them, and the rebels are attacking them. And Japan is presented positively. Uh, An Chungun makes it very clear that, that there's a Japanese officer there who is on the same side and who recognizes An and his family for what they did against other Koreans. So again, we see this issue of Koreans working with other people uh, in order to deal with their domestic situation. Moreover, we also have to emphasize that in this time period, the Sino-Japanese War was not An's main concern. He mentions it. He does that mostly in hindsight, though, because he actually writes this in 1909. He does mention it, and he probably understood that it was going on, but his major focus was on the Tonghawk. So he was focused on domestic situation. We can't blame him for that because the Tonghawk actually attacked his area, but he doesn't show in this time period very much realization of the danger that Korean was in, right? He doesn't quite realize that or understand that yet in 1894-95. What's interesting, I think, is what makes him cognizant of the, f the problems that Korea faces internationally is his connection with Catholicism, right? His connection with Catholicism, particularly with Father Joseph Wilhelm. It's kind of a long story, but what ends up happening is after the Tonghawk Rebellion, these corrupt Korean officials come after An Chungun's father and basically want him to pay for rice that the Tonghawk stole because he recovered the rice from the Tonghawk when he defeated them in battle. And these corrupt officials put so much pressure on An Chungun's father that he actually has to flee his village and he will seek shelter in a Catholic church. And while he's there, he'll end up converting to Catholicism. And he'll come back and he'll have his whole family convert to Catholicism because this is still kind of a patriarchal Confucian society. Still got to do what your dad says. And An Chungun himself will also become Catholic. That's why at the beginning of this part, you may recall that we had a PowerPoint slide that didn't just say An Chungun, it said Thomas An Chungun. That's because uh, when An Chungun was baptized, he took the name Thomas after one of Jesus' disciples, the one who is said to have gone to India. And An Chungun, that was very special to him because that was the disciple that went to Asia. Or at least as close to Korea as any of the early disciples appear to have gotten. What will happen then is because An Chungun and his family convert to Catholicism, they're going to have close relationships uh, as leaders within the Catholic community. They're going to become leaders because they're from this elite family of wealth and prestige. They're going to come into contact with Catholic priests a lot and have close relationships with them. 
The priest that baptized An Chung Gun was a man named Father Joseph Wilhelm. Joseph Wilhelm is complicated because Wilhelm, of course, is a German name. I mentioned earlier that most of the missionaries, uh, Catholic missionaries, were French. And he's complicated because he was from Alsace-Lorraine, which was this province, which, by the way, is where my ancestors were from, that switched hands between the Germans and the French. So he had a German name, but he was French culturally, and he, he spoke fluent French and was a member of one of these French missionary orders. But he, in part because he was from this very strategic area in Europe, was very interested in the outside world. And that's going to give him a window to kind of uh, to be able to give information to An Chung Gun about the outside world. Uh, and to help him understand Korea's predicament. Now, I also want us to understand, though, that, and I'll mention this later, is that An Chung Gun himself became a very devout Catholic, even though his dad told him to convert. The religion would really become his own. And one thing, uh, on the left, you can see a piece of calligraphy that An Chung Gun wrote, and it says, Respect Heaven. You will also notice it has his handprint, and you'll notice that his pinky finger and ring finger are about the same length. That's because, he, remember, he cut off the tip of his ring finger in order to write Korean independence on a flag. And An Chung Gun was known for his calligraphy, and you have to be a really good calligrapher if you can write not only with ink, but with your own blood from your severed finger. That's pretty impressive, I think. What then leads to An's political awakening is the Russo-Japanese War, and in particular, Father Joseph Wilhelm's explanation of what's going on, right? So this is key to on realizing that Korea is in trouble. And this is again from his autobiography, and he writes, the sound of Russian and Japanese gunfire could be heard from the port of Incheon, announcing the beginnings of the great crisis of the East. Incheon is the port nearest to Seoul. Father Hong, that's Father Wilhelm, Hong was his Korean name, sighed, Korea is indeed in imminent danger. I asked, this is An chung why is that? He responded, if Russia wins, it will take over Korea. If Japan wins, it will want con to control Korea. So either way, Korea is in peril. At that time, I began to carefully examine newspapers and magazines every day and to study the histories of various countries so that I could try and determine what was going on and what would happen in the future. So An chung because of his connection with Catholicism, understands now what's happening. He understands the threat. He understands that this war between Russia and Japan has something to do with Korea and in fact is dangerous to Korea. So in a sense this is his nationalist awakening and it's brought about because of his connection with Catholicism which gives him this greater understanding of the outside world. So it's not until this period that he really becomes interested in national politics but because he has wealth is remember his family's high of uh, local high status local gentry and because he can read and write he had that confucian education he's able to read all these materials and uh, in chinese and be able to understand what's going on uh, in the world he will also read korean texts as well but these are often written in chinese he could also read korean too so how then does an chung gun react to learning about the difficult situation korea is in well, his initial reaction into, is to support and participate in the Patriotic Enlightenment Movement. The Patriotic Enlightenment Movement is a term we use to refer to these attempts of peaceful means to strengthen the Korean nation and Korean uh, state in order to help maintain Korea's independence and build a modern country. So, for example, An chung will help support schools that are based around learning modern knowledge. He will also focus on trying to build up Korea's economy by investing in a coal mine, right? And of course, access to coal is necessary for an industrial revolution. Realizing, with many other Koreans, that because Korea owes, owes money to Japan, that gives Japan influence over Korea. In fact, Egypt had suffered colonization in part because they owed a lot of money to Britain and Britain was able to use that to expand their power, people like An chung Gun were afraid that the same thing might happen to their country. So he will also participate in the debt repayment movement. So this shows us that An chung Gun was interested in modernizing Korea. He was willing to make the changes that people in Meiji Japan, for example, had been willing to make. Remember, I made, drew that comparison between him and the lower samurai. 
that were willing to engage in these modernization reforms to make their country stronger. The problem, though, is that Korea faces a much different situation than Meiji Japan. So Korea has very little time, as we talked about before, in order to actually do anything, right? Korea does not have uh, decades to try and modernize. So while An will attempt at first to make these uh, peaceful means, to follow peaceful means of developing his country, over time, in fact, a very short amount of time, Korea will soon find itself in very dire straits. In particular, remember the events of 1907. I'm not too strict about years in this class, but I do want you to remember what happened in 1907. Remember, that's the year of the Hague incident, where the Korean emperor, Gojong, attempted to get his representatives to be heard at the Hague Peace Conference to protest Japan forcing Korea to accept the Protectorate Treaty. That, and then remember, Japan responded, particularly Ito Hirobumi, I should say. Remember, Ito Hirobumi is the resident general of Korea. He forces Emperor Kojong to uh, abdicate, to stop being emperor in favor of his son, who could be controlled because there was something wrong with him. He also forces Korea to sign a new treaty, giving uh, Japan more power in Korea. And also, he will force the abolishment of the Korean army. And so the Korean government is just basically a, a shell, a puppet of Japan. It can't even protect itself, let alone the entire country. And you'll remember also that soldiers in that Korean army that had been disbanded will take their weapons and retreat into the mountains and continue fighting uh, against Japan violently, leading to the growth in what's called the Righteous Army Movement. And what happens is because the Korean government is basically just a shell of its former self and is clearly just a puppet of Japan, these soldiers feel that it is justified for them to continue to fight. And now that there is, in a sense, no army, the people of Korea make up the army. So On will say, look, our country's in trouble. The Japanese are putting so much pressure on us, there's not time for things like schools and coal mines to work. We have to fight back. So On will actually leave Korea for Manchuria and help form a righteous army and will lead men into battle. Uh, his army will march into Korea to do battle with the Japanese. His army will win one victory and then will be defeated and effectively destroyed by the Japanese military, which is simply put better armed and has more people. And this puts on Chingun in kind of a quandary. He has kind of a difficulty, right? Uh, he tried to use peaceful means to work, but those there's not enough time for them to work for those to work. He has now tried to fight the Japanese with military power, and that has also failed. So he's in a difficult situation. What should he do? Now, before we can answer that question, we have to turn back and look a little bit more at Ito Hirobumi and what he had been up to and what had been going on in Korea. Uh, things were not going well for Japan and Korea. Uh, Ito had hoped to build a modern, strong, independent Korea that was friendly to Japan. Right? That was Ito Hirobumi's goals. And he did this for two reasons. Uh, one was he was sympathetic. He, he did have a certain respect for Koreans. He thought Koreans could pull off a Meiji restoration, in a sense, for their own country, just like he had helped do for Japan. At the same time, a modern, strong, independent Korea that was friendly to Japan would take care of Japan's security concerns. Right? Japan would not feel threatened if there was a strong, friendly, independent Korea because it could keep out foreign influence and would be allied with Japan. And that would be cheap. Annexing and trying to control a country completely is very expensive. But if you can help Koreans develop a strong, independent Korea that is friendly to Japan, that would be very expensive for Japan, and it would take care of its security concerns. However, Koreans resisted what Ito was trying to do in Japan for very good reason, because he was co constantly violating their independence, as we've seen with these treaties he forces on the Koreans. And so in the end, the Japanese government just decides, you know what, when the right moment occurs, we need to just go ahead and annex Korea, and then we'll just control it directly, because this policy is not working. Uh, annexation will be more expensive, but at least it will take care of our security concerns. And as part of this, Ito then resigns as resident general, and he will next be assigned to a mission to Manchuria. So what is happening in Manchuria? Why is Ito Hirobumi going there? Well, during this time period, 
Japanese influence was expanding into Korea and into Manchuria as well. Remember this region that we'll talk more about that's to the north of Korea. And the Russians also had some interests there. And Japan and Russia did not want to have another war. So they were going to meet in order to basically divide up Manchuria between them. And I want to emphasize, remember, Manchuria is Chinese territory, right? Manchuria is Chinese territory. So this is a little bit odd from the perspective of the Chinese, and that's why it was kind of kept secret, right? They're going to meet, people know they're meeting, but they're not openly saying, hey, we're going to discuss Manchuria. But the Chinese knew what they were going to do, and Koreans like An Chung Gun knew what they were going to do. And I want to point out, in this picture, you'll notice that it says, uh, 1909, 1026, that means October 26, 1909. And then there is a tile there at the bottom that has an arrow pointing at another tile with a square. And this is at this railway station at Harbin where uh, Ito Hirobumi is going to meet with this Russian finance minister. And you can probably guess what all this means, but I'm not going to tell you just yet. Let's see if you can guess. But as I mentioned previously, uh, An Chung Gun uh, wasn't sure what to do. And he heard that Ito Hirobumi was going to be going to Manchuria. So he decides that he is going to take action. And he writes a poem as he's trying to figure out exactly where Ito Hirobumi will be going to Manchuria. And he writes, When a great man is in the world, his intentions are lofty. Surveying the world, when should he accomplish his deed? The times make the hero, and the hero makes the times. The east wind is blowing colder, but the great man's righteousness burns hot. Full of anger and bitterness, he will decisively accomplish his goal. You rat thief, Ito, how can you escape death? How can things have come to this? And yet the situation is becoming worse. Countrymen, my countrymen, quickly accomplish this great work. Long live Korean independence. Long live our fellow Koreans. So An chung is planning something. I wonder what he could be planning. And if you haven't guessed by this time, his plan was to kill... Ito Hirobumi. Right, so on October 26th, 1909, in Harbin, Manchuria, Thomas Anshungun will shoot and kill Ito Hirobumi. And this is one reason why he's so popular in Korea today. He, uh, at a time when Koreans are constantly being beaten up on, he was actually able to successfully strike back against the Japanese. And it creates this very curious situation where a Korean national hero is a national hero because he killed a Japanese national hero. Ito Hirobumi was considered a hero in Japanese history. So it's this very, very complex situation. But this is why he, in a sense, is so popular in Korea today.